Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the first of our Bushfire Resilience webinars, How Houses Are Destroyed by Fire. This series of presentations has been organised by Bushfire Resilience Incorporated, which is an independent, not-for-profit association focused on improving community awareness and preparedness for the threat of bushfire. Before we begin, I would like to emphasise that these webinars have been organised on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and the elders of other communities who may be joining us today. My name is Malcolm Hackett, and I'm the Chair of the Board of Valley Community Financial Services. We are a board of volunteers who manage the community company which owns and operates the five Bendigo Community Bank branches in Hurstbridge, Diamond Creek, Eltham, Doreen Mernda and Kinglake. We are a for-profit community enterprise which returns up to 80% of our profit in the form of community strengthening sponsorships back to the communities which support the branches. We've returned in excess of $6 million since we began. If you are involved with a local club, a group, school or agency, then you will have experienced our support. We have a long history of engagement with emergency preparedness in Nillimbik through our support of CFA brigades and SES groups. Following the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires, we contributed in excess of $250,000 to local fire affected residents and communities. We're proud to sponsor and contribute to this innovative webinar series. As a resident of Strathewan, I have direct experience with the webinar topics as a result of Black Saturday, when our home and farm business was destroyed by fire. In the months following Black Saturday, I was elected, along with nine other residents, to lead Strathewan's renewal. I have vivid memories of the destruction, the loss of life and the collective grief, the bewilderment of facing rebuilding, addressing the fine print in our insurance documents and then wading through the requirements of planning and rebuilding. I can assure you that understanding your risks and taking action to reduce them is one of the best investments you can make, not just from a financial standpoint, but for the sake of your well-being and those that you love. Thank you for registering your interest and for submitting your questions. You'll also be able to ask questions as we proceed. The Q&A button appears at the bottom of your screen. This will help us to gauge our audience priorities and concerns. Our moderators will sift and group the questions so we can cover as wide a range of topics as possible. We'll only be able to address questions which are on the topic, but we will endeavour to provide online answers to questions which can't be covered in the live session. Please keep your questions short and to the point. These webinars are being recorded and everyone who has registered will be sent the link. Please note that the webinars and the presenters are providing information, not advice. Every property and individual circumstance is unique. Our intention is to provide information about the bushfire threat, property preparation, insurance and planning issues, but it's your responsibility to seek advice for your particular situation. Today, our presenter is Justin Leonard from the CSIRO. Justin has dedicated his 26 year research career to understanding how bushfire risk to life and infrastructure can be managed. His research combines learning from bushfire exposure experiments with bushfire survey investigations <coughs> and computer modelling of bushfire interactions with buildings. Justin has gained a reputation as an informative and engaging presenter, and we're very grateful for his contribution. 
Justin will present for 20 minutes, then we'll take questions for 20 minutes, followed by another 20 minute presentation and then further questions. Over to you, Justin. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, I'll just load up a uh, PowerPoint to uh, take us through. Um, if you have any trouble with this PowerPoint not being framed appropriately in the screen, you should find a uh, tag at the top of your screen where you can adjust the uh, view and aspect. It'll be uh, front and centre at the top of your screen. Otherwise, enjoy. Um, I'm here to present about uh, the topic of how houses are destroyed by bushfire. And I want to start with the broader landscape topic. Um, and as we move through uh, this evening, we'll get closer and closer to the structure and then finally work through the structure itself. So let's start in the broader context of the uh, broader landscape. I guess we, in a bushfire sense, we can simplify things and say, look, we're a house in a broader landscape. There's the house in question, the the large um, unmanaged bushland that presents the hazard and carries the event to the local proximity. We have the urban context or the design and the layout involving many complexities, some that, that certainly support and help the house in shielding it, but others which provide additional fuel loads and threats to the house itself, including neighbouring properties and fences and whatnot. Um, quite importantly, the environmental conditions that precede these fire events and occur during these fire events both drive the fires and prime the bush to carry those fires to our assets, but quite importantly also um, act on our urban environment and dry them out and make them more vulnerable and prepped to be ignited by fires at the, at the same time. So it's very important to not think about our structures and our environment, how they are right now, but how they would respond and behave when they're in a dried out, desiccated state, um, which, are, which coincides with when the fires are most aggressive and, and, uh, and virulent in the landscape. I wanna take you through um, an important terminology that, that the, uh, our regulations use within the broader context of defining our broader environment. One is the term BPA, which means bushfire prone area. And the other one is called a BMO, which is a bushfire management overlay. There are two areas that we can map or have been mapped, and they play two important roles. Um, one is an, the BPA itself, forms a trigger for you requiring to build in a particular way. So it's a building control. This is where you might be required or asked to build a specific way to a certain bell level using a, a, a standard such as AS3959 or the NASH building code. It's an area where it's considered that fires are frequent enough that it warrants a specific approach to build in response to that risk of fire arrival. And within that BPA region, you get this opportunity also to consider certain types of vegetation management. And that vegetation management can follow something called a 1030 rule, which might be something you're already familiar with or a new term. And I'll certainly come back to that 1030 rule uh, later in the presentation. Now a BMO is an area within the BPA, so it's a sub area of a BPA, that's of particularly high risk. So the fires within a BMO are particularly severe and need a, therefore warrant additional requirements, which are called planning controls, where specific setbacks and extra measures are required if you use uh, plan to build and therefore need a planning permit in that area. If, if you've already um, have a house or you've bought a house that's already built, this, the BMO is actually a really useful indicator of 
whether you're in an exceptionally bad location in the landscape as far as bushfires control are concerned. The vegetation management uh, options you have within this BMO area is called a 1050 rule, which is quite similar to the 1030 rule. You can just do a little bit more and I'll explain that. You can access maps that show that where you can type in your own street address and zoom into these locations and actually see where these layers exist and where you sit in the landscape in relation to them. And the uh, web page at the bottom of the screen there is the link that takes you to those uh, publicly available maps. If we go there and have a look, we can uh, look for example at the area of Nilambic. On the left we have, we see that um, the vast majority of Nilambic is actually declared bushfire prone, so it's within the BPA. And a smaller subset, but well over 60%, of Nilambic is actually within the BMO. And you'll see from these two maps how the BMO is simply a subset or sub area of the bushfire, larger bushfire prone area designation. What's interesting is if we zoom into say a quite a small region, so let's go down and have a look at Diamond Creek. Um, well, let's look at how the urban interface shows up when we zoom right into these maps. So here's Diamond Creek up close, and this is actually what the, the page will look like when you go into actually the, uh, the Vic Plan um, maps. And you'll see on the left, there's a really uh, informative set of uh, click boxes where you can turn various layers on and off for things um, around bushfire, but also many other useful um, overlays and, and interesting um, uh, landscape related mapping features. If we actually flip to a different type of view, which is also available in this website, we look at the uh, streetscape and the land parcels. So we can basically see how we've got a heavily urbanised area through Diamond Creek with a couple of creek lines um, and forested areas within the environment and then a broader outer landscape of treed and untreed rural. So you can see how that sits. Now let's see how the BM BPA layer designates. So it designates all of that treed area and the grassed area be, um, intermix. And it also extends quite a distance into the urban interface. And that's because the actions of bushfire can reach over houses and deep within urban interfaces and affect houses many rows in. Um, and those distances and that reach has been carefully considered when they consider the extents of these maps. Now it doesn't rule out the likelihood that you could have bushfires and ember drop and ignitions well beyond the BPA. It simply says that, that at this extent is more or less a nominal threshold where the risk is dropping low enough that it doesn't warrant specific building controls. So I'd, I'd encourage anyone that's trying to get out of a bushfire prone area into a safer place to be well within the non-designated BPA areas to assume you've got to a place of relative safety. <clears throat> if we look at where the BMO maps in relation, it's a, it's, it, it covers most of that BPA area. And if you're out into these areas where you've got an exceptionally high risk, so you're embedded deep within um, a high fuel load area where there's slope and other context. So fire behavior in this area is definitely higher than, than, the, than the BPA only region. So as I said before, a 1050 rule is allowed in a BMO and a 1030 rule is allowed in a BPA. The 10 refers to the distance in meters that you can clear trees for the purposes of bushfire safety from the boundary of your house. And the 50 refers to the clearing of shrubs and surface scrubby fuels um, as a function of distance from your house in metres. So you can just see that where, where the fire may arrive with far more severity, you need a greater clearance of undergrowth under those trees to um, present a lesser threat to your structure. Now those clearance options alone do not remove 
all the threats that your house may face in a bushfire, but it starts to reduce the intensity of fire arrival um, and approach and help, helps that approach a more manageable level. <clears throat> if we sort of look at this scenario in, in plan in a simplistic way, we could be faced with forest um, right up to our structure. Um, you can see the relative distances marked out below. So issues with trees um, less than 10 metres, well, tree strike is an obvious scenario um, that, that should be carefully considered and eliminated. Um, fires act on trees. They weaken them during the fire events by burning out knots and, and attacking the bases of the trees. And if you've been through a fire previously, you'll notice that there is extensive tree fall occurring during and for the many days and weeks after these fire events. So tree strike risk is, is an obvious one and that's where the 10 metre rule plays an important role. The other aspect is the removal of shrubby vegetation under the trees, not the trees themselves. And that's a very important um, distinction. Um, and obviously the, the, where you're in a BPA and a BMO, you actually get the op option to clear your scrubby vegetation to 50 metres. Now, most importantly, the trees themselves haven't been removed. And why would that be the case? Well, there's many things to consider in, in terms of trees in their role in a bushfire. There's many pros and cons, and I've spelled some of these out um, in a table here. So some of the, I guess the, the issues with trees is, well, they're a source of embers. Certainly the bark and the bark on those trees can present, but, and they'll be the, the rough woolly bark. Um, trees are certainly a high ember risk, whereas the smoother barks um, don't present an ember risk at all. Um, they drop debris. Um, on, on the houses themselves. So that builds up in gutters and in roof valleys and up underneath houses and decks. They drop debris on the ground, which needs to be managed and cleared. And of course, they bring the risk of tree strike from either branches or falling over. But on the, on the pro side, they actually provide important shade and moisture retention for your landscape. So as our landscapes dry out, it's the treed areas that are the last of the landscapes to lose their moisture. And that moisture can play an important role in, in meaning that your house is less ignitable because it has higher moisture to contents in, it, in the decking and less stress on the plants that are around the structure. They attenuate wind, which can mean less wind action on your house to weaken the house during these events. Um, which is an important process that can lead to loss if you, um, if you have a structure that's been compromised by wind damage first. They act as radiation shields between you and the unmanaged bush. So they obscure the radiant heat as it's trying to travel between the unmanaged forest and your house. They're obviously aesthetically pleasing to most and they certainly help in retarding the growth of surface fuels under them by shading the ground. So you can actually end up with less work of, um, in terms of uh, surface fuel management. Um, tree strike re risk is an ever present issue and it can't be underestimated, not only for the house, but for the pathways and routes that you might take through the landscape um, in a fire event. Um, wind damage itself um, on these fires. The, the fires happen to occur on very windy days. That's just one of the important aspects of, of a severe fire weather day. Um, those winds themselves can act on the houses and damage them. They can, the fires um, can also um, contribute to increasing the local winds that the houses experience during the event. Now, when a fire turns up, it can do a number of things. Um, and a good way to describe fire arrival um, was an account from um, a fellow scientist called Malcolm Gill, who experienced these fires in the Canberra events. Now, he noted that the first 
fire arrival was actually a surface fire that ripped through all the ground fuels and arrived and very quickly tracked through and consumed all the surface fuels around his, around his neighbourhood. That in turn ignited many things within his urban environment that you wouldn't consider fine fuels. And when I say fine fuels, I mean things smaller than the diameter of, of a pen. That's what gets consumed in phase one. Phase two was the burning out of heavy fuels. So this was fences and other heavy elements within the, the immediate surrounds of the house. And that was actually the most challenging risk of, of a phase when, uh, when Malcolm was presented um, with the threat of losing his house and the hardest one for him to defend. In that process, there were things like hedges burning adjacent to his structure, particularly problematic vegetation up close that didn't need any ground support or connection. It was just simply a bad behaving plant on its own. And also fences and other elements burning up to the structures. And in fact, this was the photo taken at the peak of that second wave event taken from the back porch of Malcolm's house where his back fence and a power pole um, were the only points of illumination during the thick of that fire event. Now I'll leave the, um, this part now and pass back to, uh, to Malcolm for a Q&A. Um, thanks, Justin. You've got us off to a great start there. I, I, I recognise some strength here and uh, uh, properties in those, in those photos too. I was actually very, very pleased to see that uh, profile and the strong emphasis on fine fuel management, um, because I guess that's the that's the the fundamental trick that if you manage the the fine fuels and the, especially the fine fuels that form structures that connect the ground to um, more elevated fuels, you actually take out the seat or base of any fire. Um, Certainly the canopies of, of tall trees can't get involved in a fire and can't really contribute if there's nothing underneath to deal with. So that gives you that sort of ideal scenario that you saw in the cross section slides earlier. So really, really glad the respondents were emphasizing that. All right, we've, we've got some great questions here. Um, is there an easy and affordable way to find out your home's bushfire attack level rating? And if so, would having this information be a useful tool to assist homeowners to direct their attention to the more vulnerable aspects of preparing their home? Yes, I certainly um, would encourage people to um, determine their bell attack level as a, as a measure of working out whether they've got simply an ember attack problem or an ember attack and significant radiant heat and or flame problem. I'd always start with ember attack um, as the first thing to address, but it's very worth, worthwhile knowing how much of a list you actually have to solve. In terms of, of determining your bushfire attack level, it's, it's a method that's described um, within the Australian standard AS3959, which should be available in your local public library. And if it isn't, I would badger them until they got it in. <laughs> Otherwise you actually um, have historically need to pay for it. But actually since the recent fires, it's actually free to access and download. Now, actually getting a bell assessment done for you is a great thing in itself, but even better is actually learning how to do your own bell assessment and self-assessing your own property and through developing that understanding and knowledge, you'll have a far deeper appreciation for, um, for the specific risks on your property. Um, <clears throat> I, I can imagine too, it would be a useful thing for people perhaps to learn with their neighbours because you're more likely to keep a bit of a check on, on uh, each other. You might be letting yourself off with, a, with an easy answer when someone else picks up, oh, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, so a bit of call. And, be, and because this, yeah, that's right. And because the system's actually a bunch of lookup tables and a process to step through with pictures and guides and vegetation structure guides, you, re, you really can get to the end of the process without actually doing any deep maths. So 
I'd, I'd strongly encourage everyone to have a go. Yeah, good idea. Um, is it true that European tree species such as oaks are more protective of houses than native trees such as eucalypts? As a general rule, things like oaks and figs, um, by their nature and their structure, have no specific bark that presents an ember hazard and they don't tend to burn in a fire. But I guess the statement that European trees are less of a fire risk than uh, eucalypts um, is not, is not um, true in all accounts. So you can have a European tree, like I showed in an earlier slide, which was a uh, cypress or a pencil pine, um, that can burn far worse than a eucalypt and present far more acute risk on its own next to a house than a eucalypt ever could. And I guess there's also um, good and bad eucalypts. So smooth bark, like very clean bark eucalypts that are, that are virtually shiny finish um, have little to no bark hazard at all. Um, whereas other types of eucalypts can present a very high acute bark, lo bark load, which is the fundamental source of embers. And I think this is a good question that um, I, I might struggle with a bit. What, what, what defines a shrub in the 1050 rule? Is there a maximum diameter size of the trunk or you know, what actually um, is, is the definition? Oh, well, that's, that's a good question. Um, that's a regular, I, I, I don't have a scientific answer for you and that would be straight to the regulations and the T's and C's to see what's allowed. Right. I have an idea about what a shrub is, but they, they can get pretty big. Um, now I've got a question here from someone who says that they're in a BMO. What's the starting point for measuring the 50 metres? I'd suggest um, that you use the uh, closer distance to the bush between your eave and your wall. Um, mm -hmm. But I would certainly also check the T's and C's of the regulations before you head off and start cutting away. Mm. And if, if someone's in a, um, uh, surrounded by you know, unmanaged bush and they've got slopes down to the north and the northwest, um, how effective is that 50 metre scrub removal when you've got that much bush and it's downhill to the, to the north and the northwest? Yeah, so the particular issue there is what is the slope under the vegetation beyond the 50 metres or the 30 metres, so beyond the clearance point. The slope under the vegetation beyond that point is going to be the slope that supports or enhances the fire spread up to your property. And as a general rule, the fire will move with twice the speed and therefore twice the severity up a slope that's um, for every 10 degrees increase in slope up towards your property and conversely 10 degrees but slower and, and less severe 10 degrees downslope. Uh, so, yeah, it's not so much the slope between the edge of the bush and you, um, but what's what's beyond. Um, and I'd certainly, um, that's, that's a nuance where the 1050 and the 1030 rule isn't sensitive to slope. And I would be very careful and cautious about other measures and being particularly um, focused on house design and other measures when you're, you're facing a significant upslope fire approach. And, and is the, the greatest threat there the radiant heat or is it um, from, um, you know, embers being, um, you know, directed by that, by that slope and the ferocity towards the house? Well, invariably, the greatest risk by far is the ember attack and the surface fire that, um, that ignites the houses. That's the the predominant way houses are ignited. And I guess um, that doesn't rule out or uh, um, uh, underemphasize the importance of dealing with radiant heat and flame attack on particularly high risk properties. What it does sort of highlight is that even though you might be facing 
a significant upslope run through some heavy fuels, um, many things have to also align like the wind direction and a formal uh, fire front that's lined up along that slope for it to come out and express at its worst case potential. So what you find is some houses in those worst scenarios do um, are impacted by the flame contact and the radiant heat, but it's relatively rare in the broader scheme of things. And if you haven't addressed all the ember attack and surface fire issues first, then you're not really doing it justice then to, to um, before you move on to the radiant heat and flame issues. Um, I think your slides were pretty convincing um, in terms of uh, the dangers of tree fall. And there's a question here about um, being in a BMO with 40 metre manor gums outside the 10 metre um, limit. So they're with, within striking distance of the house. Where does that leave a, a landholder? At, at risk of tree strike. I was actually um, speaking to a, um, an, a person in another jurisdiction, I think it was Shoalhaven up, up in New South Wales, and they have an alternative measure, which is a 45 degree rule. So if you imagine looking from the base of your structure out on a 45 degree trajectory, your tree clearance opportunities are governed by whether that tree falls within that 45 degree incline. So that obviously deals with a 40 metre managum at 10 metres. I think uh, uh, it, it's worth thinking and, and po possibly pitching alternate enhancements to a 1030 or a 1050 rule to account for um, those scenarios. So yeah, certainly feel for that circumstance. And I guess in, in um, later webinars, we'll be able to quiz um, uh, some of the council people about how, how you would deal with that, that particular uh, issue. Yeah, and I'd certainly encourage that the next thing you can do is arborist reports and whatnot to carefully assess those trees to see if they're in a particular state that would make them vulnerable in the event of a fire. So that, are they already scarred? Do they have weak aspects to their branches and tree trunks that would put them at risk of being the ones that can fall. So uh, an informed arborist can actually help to identify where the highest risk trees are. Um, we've got a question here about um, the, the, the Victorian bushfire risk register, which identifies targeted properties. Are these properties subject to a higher level of preventative action in addition to the BMO? Yes. They've got particular additional measures and risks and you'll find that those identified areas are actually additional areas that will also fall within a BMO that are even at a higher elevated risk. And I'm not familiar myself with that Victorian bushfire risk register. Um, where would people find out about which particular areas or properties are on that list? That's an initiative that was developed and in implemented by the Country Fire Authority. So they would be the, the point of call to determine what specific aspects of that location and why that area was designated and put on the register. So there'll be, there's an actual storyline behind each of those locations and it's worth following up to see what the specifics are around each of those. Right. Um, I think lots of people um, um, would be in this predicament or at least they would have um, faced it when they're doing their gardening. What, what about bark mulch around the house um, and, and, and the fine fuel load that comes from that? What should people do there? What's the alternatives? Um, well, I think you've inferred the answer there. What are the alternatives? Because there's nothing good about bark mulch near your house. Um, it's just as bad on the ground as it is on the trees and will produce um, extensive and prolific ember load to the structures. And if the 
bark mulch is actually adjacent to the structure itself, it can also provide so much heat that it can crack windows and ignite decks and facades and building elements um, just simply at that you know, adjacent proximity. So I would suggest anything, um, or all the non-combustible alternatives, be it gravel or stone or um, physical separation. So garden beds f significantly far from a house. And if you're going to sort of use things like bark mulch or you're inevitably near a forest that has a high amber load, then you really have to focus on making your house um, ember proof because eliminating embers from those landscapes altogether from a landscaping approach is not um, technically possible or feasible. Yeah. Well, again, in, in the, the sort of landscaping and gardening uh, area, does, does planting less flammable bushes and trees really make a difference to the safety of the property? Is it, is it uh, you know, a... Uh, uh, a strategy that people can um, in, implement or are they just loading up the, the, the environment with, with you know, further vegetation? Um, no, using low, low flammable plants and less flammable plants strategically is quite important. Um, it's fair to say that if, the, um, if your garden or immediate landscape is under extreme water stress and drought. And for instance, we're in say, a level five water restriction and aren't even allowed to water our gardens and everything dies and desiccates, even the best plants will burn. But if they're in a reasonable state and they are carefully considered and selected, those plants present um, no additional risk in the landscape and in many cases can help to manage and mitigate certain things. For instance, radiant heat blockers, wind attenuators, moisture retaining, shade, all of those aspects that the trees offer, um, careful planting can also provide. And of course, aesthetics and tr um, weed and shade, sort of shade management um, on the soils to help mitigate surface fuel growth. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we've exhausted our, uh, our, our questioners. Um, perhaps we'll uh, then move on to the second part of your presentation, Justin. Yeah, sure. I'll just reshare my screen. So the second part of my presentation is um, focused around the house and the, the how, how, what the house actually experienced within that broader context. So the house obviously is presented as a bunch of possibly vulnerable elements and any detail on the house such a, as a re-entrant corner which was we're looking at two re-entrant corners here in this in this inset is a place where um, debris and embers can lodge and build up and cause small ignitions that may develop into structural fires and loss. So we can actually see here where two um, amber scorch marks have begun to burn. Now the, the owner or a neighbour has actually put them out, but even since they were put out and suppressed, further leaf debris has actually fallen into these re-entrant corners. So any detail like a roof valley, a gutter, um, a subfloor space, a re-entrant corner are all the places where um, leaf debris and embers can exploit um, and develop into small flame attacks. If those re-entrant corners are actually rotted or decayed, it simply makes it significantly worse um, with an elevated chance of ignition and transition to flame. Um, any gaps and voids, um, be it a deliberate uh, vent um, in a structure, um, is a place where embers can enter. The, the magic dimension that you need to um, protect from ember entry is two millimetres. So if the aperture or opening in a fine mesh is smaller than two, is two millimetres or smaller, the embers that get through that mesh have little to no chance of igniting anything behind it, even if it's fine debris behind that, that vent. Um, that's why 
the standards and a lot of advice points to using um, metal fly screen meshes with apertures smaller than two millimetres. Now, there's many gaps in structures that are obviously significantly larger, but some of the most obvious gaps in our buildings are quite easy to overlook, such as the, uh, the large openings above the spool of a roller door. Um, when we're approaching um, our post bushfire surveys, particularly in New South Wales, we actually found um, quite a high number of gutters on houses that were in this state where the debris in the gutters had actually burned, but the house had not been lost, which is something we virtually never saw in Victorian based post bushfire surveys. And the reason why that was the case was because in New South Wales, there was a prevalence to use metal fascias on, on their roofs. So the, the, the material or fascia the gutters screw to is actually a metal finish fascia. And a lot of the houses up there also um, benefited from having uh, metal framed roofs under the tiles or steel sheets as well. Not always the case, but um, the eave and the way things play up onto combustible eave fascias um, is a really prolific way houses are ignited and lost. And obviously quite a challenging um, prospect to address or even recognise that a roof fire has occurred or begun, particularly when you're looking at two-storey properties or you're sheltering within the property itself during the fire event. I'd always encourage people that are in the um, unfortunate circumstance of using their house to survive a fire, to monitor and roam around inside the structure during the fire event, including uh, accessing the roof space very carefully by popping your head in, up through the manhole and having a look. And ideally having something like a super soaker water pistol to um, distribute water throughout that roof space if the uh, if the the framing starts to burn in that roof space. Um, uh, I was thinking of this picture specifically when I was answering that question about heavy bark uh, mulch. This was a a Bell Twenty Nine house in Sydney, where which received a a significant fire event, um, but did not have any particularly high intensity presented to the house itself from the fire front. Um, what did happen though was Ember Attack um, ignited this um, bark uh, mulch covering on a garden bed that was immediately adjacent to the house. Now this was a relatively new build, so the gardens had not actually been planted out. They only had the the bark um, present over the soil adjacent. So the bark burning out was significant enough to actually melt the blinds through the toughened glass windows, which the house required because it was a Bell 29 build. Now, if this was a building that uh, did not require toughened glass on both of those elements, the glass would have almost certainly broken and the uh, and embers from the surrounding landscape would have entered and ignited the house. So particularly important to address garden beds and fuel loads um, against house facades and particularly windows and decks. Fences play a key role um, and they come in many shapes and sizes. One of the worst offenders is brushwood fencing. Um, it's hard to find pictures of brushwood fences um, in post bushfire surveys because they've all burnt to completion. Um, here's um, the leftover steel frame from a brushwood fence that presented a particular risk to the brick house in the distance and uh, an acute risk also to the asbestos clad house which had eight active bodied adults defending it and they saved it, but only just after extensive damage, losing windows, 
having a roof fire and a subfloor fire all to contend with concurrently simply from the brushwood fence fire. Uh, timber fences um, are a particular issue as well. We've done various experiments on timber fences and what that actually revealed was that the typical distances that timber fences are built in terms of where we're building houses as minimum setbacks from boundaries. So that's like 0.9 metres is about as close that you can build a house from a boundary without having partic particular measures like fire rated walls. Um, and that's actually the perfect distance so that when and if the fence falls over as a flaming fence, it'll strike about the centre of your window and break it even if that's a tough, tough and glass or bell 40 window. That's something that isn't actually addressed in building regulations at all, it's, but it is a very prevalent way that houses are lost. Uh, decking um, is best considered as an extensive fuel load attached to ours, where the, um, the heat from a decking fire itself is enough to ignite or break windows. Um, and of course, this photo emphasises how decking and floor elements can actually be intertwined um, where the fire actually burns up through and under into a floor cavity or space. Um, the deck itself is an issue as well as the typical things we store on our deck. Um, furnishings, plastic furnishings, barbecues, you name it. Um, all can present a combined fuel load that can be formidable for a structure. As well as um, stairs and stairways, um, any re-entrant corner or detail is an obvious place for debris to land and start to develop. Um, there are very good behaving decks and deck solutions uh, and an obvious way to go is to use a steel substructure so the support systems aren't a fuel source themselves. Um, and then either use high durability, class A durability timber top, but even better, um, specific um, bushfire resisting uh, wood, uh, like uh, composite de decking systems that are specifically designed and tested to survive bushfires. And this is an example of one of these um, loaded plastic um, decking solutions that are specifically fire retarded to resist uh, bushfire. Now this deck actually had to put up with a treated pine retaining wall which was between this uh, garden bed and the deck which burnt aggressively against it but the deck had didn't actually then develop or present any additional risk to the structure. Um, even the plate where we place our boats and caravans and cars is a very important consideration in a bushfire event. Um, these in themselves um, can present such a high heat load um, and direct radi flame attack that can take out even a well-designed, robust, specifically bushfire resistant bell house. Um, they're simply not designed to handle those types of adjacent fuel loads. And that might also be stored building materials. In this case, it was some uh, a tire and some uh, timber burning out against the brick. And you can see just how much heat is involved here where the bricks are actually starting to crumble and break because of the long bake out time frame of these high fuel loads. Um, I wanna really emphasize the role that uh, that treated pine plays in these fires. Treated pine is, as by name implies, made of pine, which itself is one of the more highly combustible structural timbers used around houses. The treatment, the CCA treatment that makes those pines resistant to rot and termites when used against earth, um, that process makes it even more readily ignitable and more likely to burn to completion than the pine that it started out as. Um, and unfortunately, when it does burn out, it releases um, significant amounts of toxic smoke into the air, which is a risk to 
people um, attempting to move around during the fire. But well over 70% of the metal salt treatments that actually went into preserving that wood actually remain in the landscape as a green ash that ends up getting washed into the soil and is very biopersistent. So it has toxic, toxic effects well after the, the fire and is a particular risk for people attempting to clean up that area or to fossick through the, the wreckage after it. Treated pine is simply not a compatible material in a bushfire prone area. And I would suggest not putting it into the landscape and to progressively phase it out of use on your property if you're in a bushfire prone area. They present a particular risk down in Bywire River where they were extensively used and they actually burnt so intensely that it actually compromised the, the support structures which had to be removed and it was a, a massive remediation process to even come back from having that treated pine burn out in the event. And it also presented direct risks to the structures. Stored material under houses is a massive issue. The houses, the best design houses are simply not designed to handle the types of fuel loads that are possible to store under them. So don't do it unless the subfloor space is fully enclosed and embertite to the same standard as your living area. The, the um, storage and location of gas bottles is always an ever present issue. Um, gas bottles when heated will flare and they'll flare in the direction opposite to the hose inlet into the gas cylinder. So when installing a gas cylinder, the direction it flares be very reticent of what that direction is. And um, absolutely imperative is to prevent that, that gas bottle from falling over under any circumstances. If a gas bottle is on its side and continues to be heated, the vent will not flare and the, it will build up an intense pressure and possibly explode like the one in the middle of this diagram, which is opened. When that goes off, that is a, an earth shattering explosion that will take out windows um, for a perimeter of upwards of 50 meters. So it, it itself can compromise many houses simply by going off on itself. Um, and there's very many, there's many examples of well-intentioned designed houses. This was a Bell uh, 40 house in Y River. And this is that we're looking down the driveway and just on the left of the driveway there, we can see a number of gas bottles. Now these gas bottles were very well installed on a concrete slab against a steel support system and chained in place. So fantastic that they were unable to fall over. Unfortunately, the tree to pine retaining walls that supported the earth behind it provided enough heat for these gas bottles to flare and they fled directly across the driveway straight into the front door of the structure and compromised even a specifically built bushfire, bushfire house. Structure to structure spread is also a major issue in areas where houses are um, in a, within reasonable proximity of each other. These are pictures synonymous with the losses in America where we start to term them as urban conflagration fires rather than actual bushfires. In the Australian context, we've noticed that houses can be compromised at distances of up to 12 metres. So this is actually a Bell 29 built house in the distant where it was pretty much at the critical point of failure simply from the heat load from its neighbor's house at a separation distance of 12 meters. Now the windows and the glazing in, in the windows was just intact and the seals had melted and the glass had started to drop out in those windows. This picture was also a, another house that had experienced the heat load of its neighbor at a distance of 12 meters. 
And this is a particularly interesting house in that it shows the front half of the house heavily scorched with the eave already um, uh, charred and has obviously been suppressed and the cementaceous cladding was quite heat affected. One of its windows, which was um, plain glass, had broken that had a fly screen over it. The second glazing element in that same window had not broken and the rest of the house looks relatively unaffected because the back half of the house was sheltered and screened by a tree that shaded the radiant heat from the neighbor's house and in doing so pretty much sacrificed itself with that level of intense radiant heat but did not ignite and present an additional fuel load to the house. So here's a great example of a very good behaving tree um, of the right type and structure that prov provided a very important strategic radiant heat barrier in an urban fire context. And just to finish off, um, I've got an example where regulations more or less have gone wrong. So this is a Bell 40 house that um, we couldn't quite understand why and how it actually burnt down in Y River. Um, I, I couldn't actually understand how it could be a Bell 40 house in Y River because it was actually clad in timber. And when we looked actually closer to it, it was they'd exploited a, um, a loophole in the building standard by building a fire resistant um, house that had a fire rating. So it was a, like something like a Bell FZ construction approach, which then didn't specifically say that you couldn't clad over that in decorative timber. <laughs> so you can see the obvious issue that the, as the decorative timber ignited and burnt, it provided direct flame attack on the Bell 40 windows within the same facade, which meant that the house failed. And you can actually see the type of detail in the bottom left of this picture where we've got a little retaining wall, a fantastic location for leaf accumulation adjacent to the combustible fascia materials, which would have supported and allowed spread of fire um, up to and, uh, and consuming this, this house. And that's pretty much the aftermath of that particular location on the house. So, a regulated house does not mean you have a great solution. Um, it takes a lot more than that and a lot more wisdom and learning to um, build a really good resilient house. And I'll leave it there, thanks. Thanks, Justin. Um, <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll take a, um, a second audience poll um, uh, first. Thanks, Ron, if you can launch that. Um, Justin, there were a few things there that, that um, uh, resonated with me. I think you, you had a, uh, a slide of a rotted window and certainly when, uh, when our ha home burnt down, I, I saw a rot our rotted window frame um, catch uh, fire. The, uh, the flames went straight up the, uh, the window frame and caught on the old roller blind that was above the window and it went from there straight into the roof. And so the, uh, the ignition of the roof space was all over in about, in about a minute, uh, maybe wow. less than a minute. So that, that, um, that rang true to me. And the other thing, uh, your, your comments on um, treated pine, uh, there were a number of farmers like me up here who, uh, who had uh, treated pine posts in, in fences in paddocks that didn't burn but the, um, the fence posts did burn from embers that were being blown across them. So that, that being able to ignite just off the embers, even when the, the, the grass around them was, um, um, hadn't burned, um, was uh, you know, really sig significant. That was one of the more amazing observations that we were making. Where did our fences go when, uh, when a paddock hadn't actually burned? Um, where, we're up to about 68% on our, on our vote. We, um, we might start with um, one of the questions here. With terracotta tile roofs, what preventative measures are recommended? Firstly, in the lead up 
to the summer bushfire season and, and secondly in the scenario of a, a, an approaching bushfire? Yeah, a terracotta roof presents a particular problem in that they certainly aren't, they just inherently aren't embertite. Um, the ridge lines certainly are if they're well pointed and covered, but the tiles don't simply don't sit tightly enough over each other to prevent long-term leaf debris and build up under the tiles and also allow embers through those same gaps. Um, so you pretty much um, don't have an easy fix. Um, watering the roof down doesn't fix it. Um, there, there isn't much you can do um, short of um, removal of the tiles and significant remediation of what's under those tiles, like putting, a, putting up a special um, fire resisting sarking over your existing frame and, uh, and putting your tiles back on or moving to a different roofing system is really the only um, reliable and viable way to eliminate that as, as a risk. Um, simply the, the timber framing elements immediately under it, even if there's conventional sarking over them, um, which is typically only even under the timber tile battens that are holding the battens in place, don't offer any significant protection from a roof fire um, that could develop to a massive you know, house fire where the first you, you realise is that your roof plaster is collapsing in multiple rooms at once. Mm -hmm. Horrifying thought. Um, the uh, the poll results are up there. Um, uh, any response to um, uh, to that first poll? Oh, it's a good spread, and I guess that's what I expect because um, probably the best box to tick in this one, which wasn't available, was all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but great to see the emphasis on combustible materials from around the house and under the deck and subfloor because um, those key points come up time and time again um, and are often often overlooked. So it's really great to see a particular emphasis and diligence on that. Um, but there really isn't it, it really isn't all of the above approach. Is the is is what's needed to be. There, but um, that last one is probably the most overlooked. So great to see the strongest response there. Um, that's good. Now we've got um, uh, plenty of questions here. Is, is it best to keep the car in an enclosed garage adjoined to the house or park it away from the house when preparing for a bushfire? If, if the garage is essentially ember proof, then uh, then it's fine to keep it in that location. And in fact, that gives you some particularly useful options for leaving a house that may become compromised during the throes of a fire event. So you can imagine that the contingencies that you may have to leave the house, if the house ha happened to start to burn, you'd rather leave the house in a vehicle than on foot. So having an ember tight garage with a car in it gives you that op opportunity. If your if your garage simply isn't ember proof at all, well, having it completely devoid of any fuels, and, um, stored materials, and vehicles is by far the best approach. Um. What's the best way to protect a uh, wooden doorstep? from embers? Oh, that's a tricky one. So the, a wooden doorstep would be the lower threshold. I, I um, guess so, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would probably consider trying to um, wrap it with uh, some type of metal flashing or finishing. It'd probably give you one of the more durable um, solutions. Mm. Um, here's a, a question that I think would um, a lot of people would want an understanding of. There's someone who's already installed plastic tanks for the house supply. Is there any way that they can protect them from radiant heat? What we've found is 
plastic tanks and by plastic I assume it's polyethylene tanks which are the dominant sort of pl plastic tank type are fine if they are on their own completely isolated out in an open paddock so they can handle a low level grass fire and even a bit of debris blown up against them they will suffer and burn um, a little bit but they won't, won't um, lose their integrity or lose the contents of the water within them. If you put two tanks next to each other, that's when you start to have problems. Even in that open paddock scenario, the debris that builds up between the two tanks will burn, the tanks start to burn, and then one burning tank will feed onto and off the other tank, and you'll get this chimney effect between the two tanks that will develop to a crescendo until both tanks have actually fully ruptured. Um, and that rupturing process can be quite severe. So it's a, we've seen tanks rupture, say, a, a, against a steel shed or a house, and it's equivalent to, a, to driving a car into the side of the shed at about 50 k's an hour. So it's like a really huge amount of brute force. Um, so yeah, tanks, with any heavy fuel element around it that will start to burn, even if that's treated pine boxing that you've used to form the platform to get a level surface to put the tank on is enough to, to, to take out the tank. So to actually protect it, it's quite tricky, um, but whatever you do, it has to look at how to prevent debris building up against the base or having any heavy fuel elements near it to burn in sympathy with the tank. Um, protecting it and flashing it off is usually counterproductive because the debris and leaf debris end up um, going between the covering and the tank itself. Mm. What, um, what about... Um roof mounted evaporative coolers, they cause problems? Yes, they're, they're, quite, they're quite problematic in fires. Um, there are a few um, brands that specifically are targeted towards being bushfire resi resistant. So they have specifically designed fine meshes and non-combustible filters and, fil and, and the whole box is essentially non-combustible. Other than that, they, they burn prolifically during these fire events. Um, one of the things if you um, have quite a switched on um, electrician and plumber, you can actually um, fit an, an override switch to them that allows you to recirculate the water over the filters without pumping air through them and have them operating in that mode during a fire event. That will help to reduce the risk of them being lost, but you've obviously got an issue that you need water and you need power to be maintained through that event for that to actually work. Um, but if you've already got one and you're trying to make the most of the situation, it's approaches like that that will help, as well as dropping over a fine mesh screen over the entire unit to try and protect it from embers. Um, that that method is that a uh, just for a clever electrician and plumber, or or is it possible to purchase that uh, that approach, you know, off the shelf? I'm not. Sure. I haven't seen a kit specifically aimed for that, um, but I have seen a couple of models that have a a, a self cleaning cycle that um, does something similar. Mm. So worthwhile exploring that. Um, while, while we're on uh, roofs and water, we're, we're spraying the, um, the roof with water with an automatic system during an ember attack do much good? And, and what about the effects when the, when the flame front reaches the house? So, so water on the actual roof um, does virtually nothing for a roof that has ember gaps in it. Let's say we're talking about the terracotta tile roof scenario um, that we were discussing previously. The water simply doesn't seal the gaps. It flows over the tiles, but 
that the ambers can blow up to and through those gaps, even if the roof tiles are wet or water is dribbling over those gaps. Um, the roof tiles themselves aren't combustible, so making them wet doesn't help. Um, the same with steel roof. Um, the thing that water on the roof does do is flow into the gutters and the debris that has built up in those gutters will obviously then be wet. So it does address some aspects of the debris around your gutters, but um, be very wary because in a lot of these fire events, when the winds are strong, the uh, spray systems that are mounted along the ridge lines of the roofs um, are spraying, but there's water only going into the downwind side gutters and virtually none get into the upwind side gutters. So if that's the case, then you've pretty much got a completely ineffective system, except for possibly your neighbor's house if he happens to be in the downwind mm -hmm. spray field of your rooftop sprinklers. Um, this, this question's related, um, and, and I guess you've touched on it there, and it's how effective is the house sprinkler system for a rectangular house with overlapping spray patterns when they're operating in the vertical plane, as opposed to just attached on the, on the top of the gutter? The, the best way to assess the viability of a spray system is to get the windiest possible day and operate them and to see what surfaces they still effectively wet. And if they're wetting things that would otherwise be a major risk like your deck or combustible cladding or extensively wet out a window, like keep the glass constantly wet, then they're offering protection to those specific elements. Um, but they don't offer protection to subfloors, roof cavities, wall cavities, which have remained dry under those cladding. So they're not a panacea for gaps and ember entries and other things. They simply have some targeted elements that they may be useful for if they can continue to wet them throughout an event. Um. After the 1969 fires, um, this person's family visited friends whose house in the foothills of the Dandenongs was left standing in the street, so it was still there, and that chap had covered everything with reflective building foil. Is that thinking out of date? The reflective building foil um, obviously does what it says, it reflects. And if it reflects light and heat, it can reflect radiant heat. And obviously if it's wrapped well enough, you've actually got a secondary amber barrier that may compensate for, for amber issues in whatever it's been wrapped over. Um, I'd say it'd be particularly challenging to get that right and also to wrap a house in a high wind scenario. And I would also caution um, in terms of what would be the most appropriate thing to use. So if you duck down to Bunnings and bought the roll of the cheapest sarking you can get your hands on, um, that in itself does not offer much protection and actually have a lot of holes burnt through it. Um, even if that's the, the what they call level five sarking, which is the sarking required to be used in AS3959 in bushfire resistant houses. So, um, so the, even though it's sort of shiny on one side, the back of it can be paper and in many cases it doesn't offer a specific barrier to flame or, um, or ember attack. Um, Justin, I think your slides showed us pretty uh, graphically what can happen if uh, if gas bottles are stored the wrong way. Could you just go through again, what are the key elements in, uh, in storing gas bottles safely? Sure, so most importantly, wherever they're stored, they need to be on a stable surface and chained with a metal chain to a metal upright uh, system that is concreted into the ground essentially. So if whatever structure they're placed near or against fell on that, on that gas bottle, it would not be pushed over. So that's, that's the primary thing. 
then the other consideration is, well, what have you put immediately around that gas bottle that could represent a significant heat load? Because as that gas bottle heats up, it will flare. And those flares are many meters long and are typically horizontal, particularly from the nine to 60 kilo um, range bottles, they will flare outwards. And that might be onto a road, it might be onto a neighbor's house. It, if it was pointed the wrong way, it might be directly at your house. Um, you really need to consider their appropriate location. The other thing to consider is the larger the gas bottle and the more full it is, the longer it needs to be heated before it could possibly flare. So if you move to a much larger single point gas bottle, and pipe that to all the locations that you might have barbecues and house usage. And you can turn that gas bottle off in its location before an imminent fire. That means you've got one source, you've got one potential flare point rather than many. And it's because it's a large gas bottle, um, it'll be far less likely to be able to be pushed over. Mm, thanks, lots of things I hadn't thought of there. Um, will pulling down canvas blinds over windows during a fire event help? Yes, you're better off having them down than up. And one of the amazing accounts from Malcolm Gill, who I showed an account of in that process, he actually had the forethought to ask that question before the camera fires actually occurred. And his accounts on the day whether the embers flew in, um, hit the canvas blinds, and because of their incline, hit and simply rolled off. And when his fence burned up past his, uh, his, his windows, those drawn canvas blinds offered significant radiant heat protection from that adjacent fence fire. And although they charred very, very slightly, so they discolored a little bit, they didn't burn in situ and provide an additional heat load to his windows. I'm amazed, I must say. I, I thought it, um, it would be a danger. Um, what about and, and just a word of warning, they're the, the old school heavy, yes. heavy set canvas blinds. Yeah. And I'd probably, the caution there would be that all blinds probably aren't created equal. Yeah. What about solar panels? Do they, do they melt or catch fire easily in a bushfire? No, they're pretty much made of glass and, and um, aluminium and metal uh, componentry um, with a very small amount of um, fire retardant uh, coated wiring out the back of them and some very small plastic boxes. So they don't represent any particular heat, additional heat load to the building. Um, they, depending on how they're installed, they can be a reason for some additional leaf debris and litter to build up on the roof on the support points. So one thing to look out for housekeeping. Um, and they can present a risk to firefighters that are trying to suppress or put out a house, even if that's on the ground, because they may continue to produce electricity even though the power's gone out and the switchboard's been isolated, there's an electrocution risk that can persist after the fire event. But no real risk or additional issues really um, in the scheme of things um, during the bushfire event itself. Okay, st staying up on the, uh, on the roof again, um, have you seen examples of um, evaporative coolers being ripped from the roof? In, um, in strong winds and then allowing embers to get into the roof cavity because of that? Oh yeah, definitely. There's so many examples of where the roof has been compromised before or during the fire event due to the simply the, the wind loads that are part of the worst of the days that we see these fires come at. So as soon as you start approaching wind gusts of 75 kilometers or more, you can expect to see tiles dislodge, um, roof sheeting peeled back or peeled off the, uh, the actual screws, um, the loss of um, vents, whirlybirds, 
um, evaporative coolers. And every one of those actions um, opens a roof or a house up to a prolific ember attack. So you can see the synergies there. Mm. I've even seen entire roofs taken off houses during these fire events and trying to make sense of the the order of the things unfolded for various locations. Um, I think Black Black Saturday in our surveys we found 13% of the structures we surveyed had evidence of some type of extraordinary wind damage. And so that's 13% that had obvious examples. Many more would have had wind damage, but were simply piles of rubble on the ground that you couldn't deduce um, a, a scenario for. And perhaps um, for our last question, um, what's your view on uh, fire retardant paints? Yes, they can be particularly useful and interesting. Um, the, the the main challenge with fire retardant paints is their their efficacy as a fire retardant will diminish over time. So they might be exposed to the actions of rain and ultraviolet light from the sun. And those two processes will constantly degrade the paint and make it less effective over time from um, being a useful fire retardant coating. So be very reticent of the recoating and reapplication requirements of that approved and tested system and follow the directions on applying it um, in exactly the right way so it meets even the expectations of that duration. Um, using it in areas specifically that aren't exposed to the weather is a really possible free kick. So getting under your house and painting the subfloor with a fire retardant paint that will never see the sun or constant rain action um, throughout its life means that it could actually have a very long, long life as an effective retardant. And even painting the roof beams in your roof um, is another possible one, be it, um, quite challenging unless you pull off your roof sheets or have a particularly accessible roof cavity. Um, yeah, I've, I've never really thought of those. They're, they're, um, that's terrific. Gives a lot of food for thought. Um, thanks, Justin, um, for the presentation. Certainly um, it was um, really clear and easily digestible, but thank you too for letting us interrogate you um, see if we could uh, um, trip you up with any questions there um, and, and for uh, giving us your time today. We, we really appreciate normal, uh, enormously um, the, uh, your research knowledge and, and your experience and what you've um, put into uh, this, this presentation for us. And we're looking forward to uh, next Thursday, oh sorry, Thursday week, um, when uh, we learn about how to uh, harden an existing home, um, th that'll, uh, that'll be something to uh, build on the knowledge that you've already given us. Now, folks, um, when you leave the webinar, you'll automatically receive a, a short questionnaire and it's designed to help us make some improvements. Um, and we'd uh, like you to respond uh, promptly if you, um, if you will. Um, uh, before we uh, finish, I've got a couple of things. Um, I'd uh, like to um, thank Max Garner and Neil Marshall, Alan uh, Bloom and Mark Gravel of the, uh, the Bushfire Resilience Incorporated for their uh, commitment and the hours of planning that they've put into conducting the, uh, the, this series. And special thanks to the CFA District 14 HQ for their support in providing the webinar platform and the behind the scenes technical assistance by Rowan Thornton, which has been fantastic. Can I say um, our, our sponsors, our Benigo Bank community branches have sponsored this series because the topics are fundamental to the safety and the well-being of our community. Uh, if you're looking 
at your banking or your insurance needs, please consider our highly competitive bank products and give one of the local branches the opportunity to quote. Thank you for participating and we'll see you Thursday week.